we must reject any form of fundamentalism. That's what President Obama said before the United Nations. Think about it. When you study that, that finds out part of that's the church. Also, America's at the crossroads. With George Barnard talks about that, including a panel with Kenneth Copeland and David Barton. Check it out. Well, can you believe it? September the 20th, 2016, just a couple of days ago, or a month ago, our president spoke at the United Nations, and what did he say? He said very specifically that uh, fundamentalist, religious fundamentalism needs to go. Let's go there right now and hear him say it. Take a look. Alternative visions of the world have pressed forward, both in the wealthiest countries and in the poorest. Religious fundamentalism, the politics of ethnicity or tribe or sect, aggressive nationalism, a crude populism, sometimes from the far left but more often from the far right, which seeks to restore what they believe was a better, simpler age free of outside contamination. This leads me to the third thing we need to do. We must reject any forms of fundamentalism. That's so important because he's saying, you know, you need to reject it, which kind of lines up with a lot of things that are going on. And he's talking about, you know, lining up with modernity in his speech. We'll make the whole speech available for you. And that basically is just saying the modern day needs to do away with the traditional religious beliefs. As a matter of fact, if you look up the word fundamentalist and fundamentalism, you can actually better understand what he's saying we need to do away. Let's take a look. Fundamental, fundamentalism is a form of religion, especially Islam or Protestant Christianity, that upholds belief in the strict, literal interpretation of Scripture. Think about that. So if you read the Bible as a Christian, you believe that that's the inherent word of God in its original intent, without error, without error in its original manuscript, and you live your life by that, you're considered a fundamentalist. That's what I abide is all about. That's what a living a Christian lifestyle is all about. And he's saying we need to do away with that. And it's and we've got to really pay attention to that. It makes me think about, you know, specifically, you know, even with Hillary Clinton, the former Secretary of State, she's saying that the fundamental religious beliefs need to be change? Let's go back and listen to her. Deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs have to be changed. Fundamentalism is us reading the Bible, believing it as the Word of God, and living our life accordingly, and they're saying that needs to be done away with. Granted, there's religions out there that, that do terrible things based on their faith, but Christianity is not that way. That's why America has been so blessed in its history, and they're wanting to do away with it. And so we got to understand, you know, what am I? What am I? Am I a fundamentalist? And the thing about it is, well, maybe, according to George Barna in his recent book, America's at the Crossroad, Crossroads, he talks about a statistical reality of where we are right now in America. And if, understand, remember, fundamentalism is where we believe as Christians that the Bible is the Word of God and that we... Uh, stick to that scripture the best that we can and live our lives according to it in view of God's mercy and because of His grace. But we live our lives as close as we can to what scripture says. And he's saying we need to do away with that. Well, look at the statistical reality of what George Barna found out in his book, America's at the Crossroads. So we'll think about this, a biblical worldview. When people don't have a biblical worldview, it means they do not, they're not in scripture. They don't believe what God's saying in the Bible. So this has to do specifically with how people see God, how people see Jesus as Christians, how people see Scripture. And he's saying the ones that see it as literal and to live a strict lifestyle according to it needs to be done away with. Well, we'll find out with these statistics with George Barna that many people are already doing without being uh, seeing Scriptures that way. Let's take a look. That's so important, talking about a biblical worldview. And that's what George Barna's book, America at the Crossroads, he's talking about as he began to explore the trends shaping America's future and how we, what we can do about these particular trends. And it's having a biblical worldview. First, we're going to tell you some of the stats that he talks about of where the church is at. But then we're going to show you the stats, what happens when we do get a biblical mm -hmm. worldview, of what Pastor Jackson was just talking about. Let's start with, what's this first one here? What does it say? 90%, 9 out of 10 adults believe in God. So you get excited. You get excited when you hear when you when you hear that. Mm -hmm. You get excited when uh, you're hearing that nine out of ten 
But then the next thing lets us know is like, oh, it's not the same guy. Yeah, right. so what's the next one? 60%. Uh -huh. Only 6 out of 10 believe in the God of the Christian Bible, a deity who is all-knowing, omnipresent, has unlimited power, created the universe, and rules that universe today and forever. Okay. Most Americans, 78%, accept the idea that Jesus Christ was a real person, but fewer than 40% believe that he was both human and divine and that he lived a sinless life on earth. Fewer than half of all Americans, 45%, contend that Jesus Christ is actually alive today. What's the next one? While the same proportion of adults, 30%, reject the idea that a good person can earn a place in heaven, a larger and growing share of the public, about half, doesn't know what to think about what happens after they die. Okay. 12% decline in a born again... Uh, 12% decline in born-again believer over the last 10 years who believe they have a responsibility to share their faith. Okay, let's keep on. Only 25% of the public believes Satan is a living entity. 91% uh, of all households still, still own one or more copies of the Bible, but bear one-third of all adults firmly believe that it is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. Slightly over half of the public believe the Bible is either the actual Word of God, yet 22% take it literally. 33% mm -hmm. say it's the inspired and inerrant Word of God containing symbolisms. 44% contend the Bible contains historical errors or personal interpretations that prevent it from being a trustworthy document. Only half of adults believe the miracles in the Bible actually occurred. Most people lean towards believing that the Bible, Quran, and the Book of Mormon are simply different expressions of the same spiritual truth. Only one out of eight adults consider themselves to be highly knowledgeable about the content of the Bible. Those who have a biblical worldview are 12 times less likely to engage in extramarital sex, nine times more likely to avoid adult-only material on the internet, and eight times less likely to gamble. Uh, those who have a biblical worldview are five times more likely to believe that Satan is real, not just a symbol of evil. They're five times less likely to believe the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon are simply different expressions of the same truths, and four times more likely to reject the idea that a person can reach heaven through personal goodness or doing good works. Those of a biblical worldview are three times more likely to affirm the holiness of Jesus Christ, three times more likely to intentionally not watch a movie or video because they know it contains objectionable content, and three times less likely to get drunk. They are three times more likely to pray for the president, three times more likely to read the Bible other than at church services or events, they're three times more likely to believe the Bible describes homosexuality as sinful. They are two and a half times more likely to believe the Bible is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches, and twice time, or two times more likely to volunteer time to help the needy. Imagine, Imagine what the society would be like if more people had a biblical worldview. Absolutely. So we're looking at, if you think about, you know, religious fundamentalism, it's already with the narrative, the things that society's been doing, pulling God out of prayer out of schools, the Bible out of schools, uh, just shifting away from the original intent of our nation. Statistics say there's very few Christian fundamentalists right now in America. And it's not over, but the fact is we've got to begin to believe again, begin to walk out again, and begin to teach people the ways of God. And that's why we talk about Emmaus Road Discipleship. You know, if you, ha you don't have a discipleship plan for you, we have one for you at uh, vinefellowshipnetwork.org. Click on Emmaus Road and begin your journey because right now people are drifting away from the very thing that, that makes us stable as a nation, which is God's way of walking out in view of His mercy and because of His grace. And this nation was built on one of the founding documents of our nation was the Bible. And if we leave the Bible, we're leaving one of the major founding documents of our nation. Listen, join us after the break. We're going to have and be speaking about why every life matters to God. The life in the womb, the elderly life, and all the ages in between. So important with our vote coming up and how we're voting on this issue. Join us after the break. It's amazing what we're seeing take place. And that's a big deal when 
we're looking at extremists have gone in the nation and they've let it happen over a period of time and now they're trying to identify every single faith as mm -hmm. that kind of extremism and it's not. And letting radical Islam do right. what it's done in the caliphate, uh, trying to make that happen and doing these different things that was going on, kind of letting it happen. Because we were, saw it in six days in Iraq. We were there with the Kurds mm -hmm. you know, on VFN TV, you know, watching what was taking place up there. And it could have been stopped a long time ago. Long time and ago. now we're with Russia making a law this year that making evangelism and sharing your faith illegal, mm -hmm. uh, that you can't invite somebody to your church without permission, and you can't post anything on social media. It's against the law. And they, they, they've allowed that fundamentalist one radical belief of Islam to permeate culture, and now people are focusing, well, we need to do away with that. But they call it what you are. They call it a religious mm -hmm. a fundamentalist, which is somebody who has strict belief in the Word of God. So it's almost you're counseling out your own freedom That's by right. saying to do it with that versus like, we just need to defeat ISIS. It just needs to end. And that's a very important decision coming up on who you're going to choose to, to be our next leader. But why does every life matter? We're going to continue. Faith, think about this. Faith for our nation. Begin to believe God that He can do powerful, mighty things. We've talked about several times. It doesn't matter what the enemy's doing. It matters what we are in our position to God and having faith that God sees us turning back to Him, saying, we do want you to be the Lord of our life. We want you to be over this mm -hmm. nation to forgive us where we've sinned against you. And God hears, and all of a sudden, the enemy stops coming your way. Let's join Kenneth Copeland, David Barton, and Bishop Keith Butler as they're talking in this continued series, Faith for the Nation, Why Every Life Matters. David, uh, give the people a synopsis of how those platforms are put together, how they come together from all over the United States and then they come to the convention and so forth. Because people don't understand the fact, you, you just said something that 99% of the people in the United States don't know, that that platform is going to affect, that that's what they're gonna, that's what the people are gonna promote, that's what they're gonna do on the local level, on the state mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is, it's, it's like, it's like sewing it in your underwear, man. You can't get rid of it. That's right. Once you get it in there, yeah. it can't get it out. That's right. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> <laughs> it came from. That's as a Texas. Uh, that's one of our. Uh, yeah, I guess, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, I guess that's just that's, West Texas. Ain't that's it? us, man. <laughs> well, David, before you. I know exactly you... where that. Is. I, I. Did anybody else have trouble understanding that? I got that. We Texans get that. David, before you go into the description of how that happens, I just want to give a case in point, because. In 2012, you, we, I was over at your house, and you gave me an assignment. And it, I know it was of the Lord. And you said, you said, George, you take the platforms. And I took, I took the Republican, I took the Democratic platform. And you said, you, you read those platforms to the pe people, and then you read the Word of God and see which one fits. So I did that in 2012. I'm doing that now for our church. And it's, it's fascinating to me to read in detail. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, how many people actually read the platforms? Zero, almost. Yeah. And I'm reading this, and it's, it's very clear to me. And let's take abortion. From well, let, let, me, let me say the zero comment. Yeah. Four years ago in the presidential election, with $200 million spent between the candidates, the number one Googled term on election day was who's running for president. That was the number one Google term on election day. Wow. Who's running for president in 2012. So if they don't know who's running for president, the chances that they read platforms, mm, Astounding. None. It is. It's astounding. None. It is That's astounding. And, and you know, I, I, I will tell you, that if you stand before God and he says, well, why did you vote for that platform? Well, I didn't read the platform. I don't think he's going to buy that excuse. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's no. going to be acceptable to him. So, George, I'm sorry. I, no, I, no, no, I that's all right. Um, th there, was something, there was something that you said, Kenneth. This is 1998. Tell my people wherever you go, those who vote for politicians knowing their immoral policies and platforms and illegal acts had better repent. They are partners with those politicians and will be responsible for every baby's death. You've taken the devil's part by not voting at all. 
-hmm. So where, <clears throat> where, the, where the platform is concerned, I'll, I'll take the example of abortion. And this is, I'm reading this straight from the Democratic platform. And this particular part has to do both with abortion and appointing judges. It says, we will appoint judges who defend the constitutional principles of liberty and equality for all and will protect women's rights to safe and legal abortion. Then <clears throat> they go on to say, we will fight Republican efforts to roll back the clock on women's health and reproductive rights and stand up for Planned Parenthood. It goes on to say, Democrats are committed to protecting and advancing reproductive health, rights, and justice. We believe unequivocally, like a majority of Americans, that women should have access to quality reproductive health services, including safe and legal abortion, regardless of where she lives, how much money she makes, or how she's insured. We believe that reproductive health is the core to women's, men's, and young people's health and well-being. We will, and you know, when you read through this and you're reading this in church, <clears throat> there's a temptation to think, well, this is getting, this is probably getting boring. Read it. Just read it. Because when you vote, you're signing your name to this contract. To this contract. Th yeah. This is what you're signing your name to. We contract. will stand up to the Republican efforts to defund Planned Parenthood health centers and will provide critical health services to millions of people. We will continue to oppose and seek to overturn federal and state laws and policies that impede a woman's access to abortion. Now, the reason I'm reading this is because what you said about abortion. Now, uh, let, let's understand what that means. That means mm. that laws that say parental consent, that a 13-year-old girl can't get an abortion without the parents knowing about it, they're going to seek to overturn that. That means that the Infant Born Alive Protection Act, where the infant, they try to abort, it's born alive on the table, they go ahead and kill it after it's out of the womb, they're going to try to overturn that. The Fetal Pain Protection mm. Act, where that after 20 weeks, we know medically that abortion, the, you can, the child feels the pain, they, they're going to try, I mean, what that says, that there are more than a dozen different types of laws yeah. to bring some humanity to this, and we're going to try to overturn every one of them, including parental rights, including informed consent, including uh, the regulatory, the ambulatory health care. I mean, the way we said it in Texas when we passed the laws, we think women at abortion clinics should have the same level of care and protection that a horse gets at a vet clinic because abortion clinics don't require the same level of cleanliness and medical care that we I require might. for veterinary clinics. They're going to try to overturn that. I mean, when, when they make that statement, George, that is a massive statement over the, a dozen <clears throat> different kinds of laws. There's now about 250 of those laws that have been passed in the last 10 years by the 50 states to bring some semblance of sanity to this. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to overturn And you're going to be part of overturning every oh, yeah. one of those? Oh, yeah. But what's important here in particular yeah. is that uh, we're talking about this subject as though people know what the scripture right. says about this, right. mm -hmm. and feel about yeah. it the yeah, way yeah. the scripture says about it. <clears throat> yeah. Most Christians that I know today cannot tell you why abortion is wrong. That's right. Uh, and they don't necessarily believe that abortion is necessarily wrong. Before you go further, I'm going to jump in because we talked about this earlier. Okay, go ahead. The reason we have abortion in America today is not the Supreme Court. And it's not Planned Parenthood. 76% mm. of Protestants do not want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. 600,000 abortions a year are performed on professing Christians, 200,000 a year on born again Christians. It's Christians that keep the abortion business going. Back to you, brother, because yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that's the reason why it exists. Uh, the biggest voting block in the country is still, quote unquote, born again Christian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the reason why we have those is because of the Christians, but that's because most Christians don't know or believe that abortion is wrong. And most pastors don't teach from the word what the scripture says about it. Because so, so before you go further, I think yeah. you need to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that. Walk yeah. through the word on this yeah. for these people watching so that they yeah. can understand. Of okay. course, like, the, like the Lord said, I knew you in the womb before you were born, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I called you to be a prophet to the nations. Well, God obviously is involved in uh, the life of an unborn child and has a plan for that life. And if you, ex if you exterminate that life, right. you have crossed God 
uh, and of course many other scriptures. So I think we need to talk about this That's right. a little bit before we go. For okay. just assume that sure. people know abortion is wrong. Not today sure. they don't. Sure. Not today. Okay, now if you talk to someone who is 35 years of age mm -hmm. and below, okay, they know nothing about the morality of abortion. Really. Okay. I appreciate the fact that our president recognizes the importance of the womb. Just recently, when he was talking about Zika, the virus, and how dangerous that can be to pregnant women and their babies. You know, what's interesting is the Zika bill, the biggest holdup on that Zika bill throughout all the battle over it, mm. because there's, the, the government is willing to spend a lot of money to help <clears throat> fight the Zika virus. The Democrats say, but we want that money to include funding for Planned Parenthood because the best way to fight Zika is to abort babies that might have been exposed to it. And on the Republican side, they said, we're not going to, we're not going to fund Planned Parenthood. We'll, we'll put all this money into fighting Zika, but not through abortions. So the biggest fight on Zika in America right now is whether federal money to fight Zika should be used to abort babies or not to abort babies. Media hadn't brought that out, but that's exactly the heart of the fight. And that's, that's the, you know, I've got so many friends in Congress, and we see it all the time, and I see the, the, the measures, the language of the bills. That's the fight, is over whether our funding, our public health funding to fight Zika is going to include funding Planned Parenthood to do abortions of, of babies that might have been exposed to Zika. That's amazing. Seventy-six wow. percent of Protestants do not want to stop the killing of children in the womb. And it's amazing to, see, to, to even come face to face with the reality. It says it's the Christians that are keeping the abortion continuing in our nation, or those that are allegedly You're right. Right, saying it. And it's just because we don't know what the Bible says. 76%. That's, that's powerful. The Protestants are saying it's okay to, and then you look at the lower numbers down to two, 200,000 mm -hmm. abortions where it was from you know, uh, people that are professing that they're born again. Mm -hmm. and. And the, the narrative over culture is family's negative, family's wrong, having children is a bad thing. And now it, it just, you know, uh, selfish by choice. We had, you know, we did mm -hmm. a program on about Child, that. Where, childless, childless by, by choice, choice. Where people are just, the narrative that they believe now is that, you know, not to, to, to reproduce, not to have children is a good thing. And to end the life of children. Uh, in the womb. It's pretty tragic. We're going to continue this talk. You know, it's amazing talks helping us get informed for, you know, voting in the polls coming up really soon. This is so important why every life matters. And if you've been a long term viewer of, of VFN TV, you know we've been mm -hmm. on, on the cutting edge of what's happening there. But let's go right back to this talk why every life matters. David Barton, Kenneth Copeland, and Dr. Uh, Bishop Keith Butler. What the scripture tells us is that uh, we create bodies. Okay, we're, we're trifle being. We're spirit being as a soul, mind, with emotions live in a physical body. We create bodies, okay? Mm, and, yeah. No, no, know, God, God's the one who That's puts right. it in. He's the father That's of right. all. He's the father of the spirit in the body, the real yeah. person, yeah. okay? He's the one who puts the life in the body. And again, for just people, people watching, that's why they have our characteristics. You know, they may have our eyes or nose or mouth or whatever stuff after the flesh. Uh, grandparents, you know, go, go back and all that uh, stuff. God's the one, he is the author of life. Throughout the scripture from the very beginning, works all the way through that God's the one who puts life inside the body. That God's the one who puts life inside the womb. Uh, that God has ch choices and plans for people mm -hmm. inside those wombs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it even, you know, gets to, you know, s other stuff in the scripture about seed being spilled and mm -hmm. other stuff. The, the, the real thing about it is that God's the one who makes the choices about who's here. For us to play God and, and to decide that if someone is not, mm -hmm. shouldn't be here for convenience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Murder. It's absolute murder. It's absolute Let murder. me. It's the definition of murder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you take an innocent individual simply because, and even science backs us up today. That's right. Now, even science tells us there's no question about it now. It used to be, you know, they used to mm -hmm. say something different, but today, even science tells you. They have brain waves, they think, they feel pain, all of that mm -hmm. uh, today. They're a fully formed individual, they got X, Y, Z. Everybody knows it. It's now, now a, a statement of fact. We know we're talking about a human being, and common sense tells you, you were once 
you're watching us, you were once in that same yeah, womb. That's right. Well, in you, that same state. You, that, uh, that, that also, the argument, it, it validates the argument from heartbeat to heartbeat. Life starts when the heart starts and it stops when the heart stops. And it, that heart starts beating in, what is it, 12 days? Eight, eight days. Eight days. Within eight days. So, man, come on, man. I mean, you, you, it's a losing fight. That's yeah. a human being. It is an absolute losing That's fight right. in the face of God. You can't excuse it. It's murder. Well, you guys were talking about how that we're making choices of who's going to be here. You know, we've been praying in this country for revival for a really long time. I mean, we've just been praying mm -hmm. for revival. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll point out that that in, in Judges 13, that's what the nation of Israel is praying for. They were under the oppression of the Philistines. They couldn't live their life the way they wanted. Philistines wouldn't let them. They had the, the wrong values imposed on them. Everything was wrong. They pray for revival. God deliver us from the Philistines. And so God answers and he sends an angel to tell his people, I've heard your prayer. I'm going to send you a revival. Here's how it works. Manoah, your wife's going to get pregnant. When that kid grows up, he's going to be the national deliverer. My kid was Samson. Yeah. Yeah. What if we had aborted Samson back then? You've just lost your deliverer. You've been praying for revival. God says, okay, I'm going to send you a new generation. Oh, we got to abort that generation. What have we lost that we don't even know? How many Samsons have we wiped out? How many cures for cancer have we wiped out? How many cures for all this stuff have we wiped out that God sent us? He was answering our prayers, and we keep wiping them out because we choose who's going to live and die. Not only that, it's an economic issue. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, how many of those, what, 60 million now? Uh, 60, uh, right at 60 million. Right around 60 mm -hmm. million. That's 60 million people that would uh, go to school, that would create products, mm -hmm. that would buy products, that would sell products that would serve the military. In other words, from an economic standpoint, 60 million people is the population of mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. okay, you're talking about the entire nation of England. So you're talking about markets where uh, when people talk about the economy. The economy can't grow. They're not people buying products. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, like, it's like the word says, the man sows, he also reaps. Okay, uh, abortion is a cat is a catastrophe for the economy, is a catastrophe for for your national survival. Look at Europe; it has a zero or minus population growth yeah. rate. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in trouble economically. Yeah. They don't have the strength militarily, uh, and the things that are happening in their nation, are the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Muslims that hate them are outgrowing them and taking over like France, for example, the nation I'm ministering in. Uh, and it's, it's happening because the Frenchmen are not having the children. The, the, the <coughs> mandatory fertility rate for a nation to have zero growth is 2.1. Right. You have to have 2.1 because you will lose some, some to accidents and some to disease. 2.1. America is now at 1.9. Uh, as you look across Europe, I don't remember the exact numbers. I think Spain is 1.3, Italy's 1.1. 1. 1. Uh, you're looking at but a France lot of them are less than that. They're, they're less than that, and the yeah. deal is that Muslims are about 7.6, I think. Right. So 25 years, you've so taken over without so, a revolution. So what's happening gen generationally is that they're taking over Western Europe through this planned way of doing it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you are uh, harming your future prodigy, the ones you do allow to live, mm -hmm. even, putting them in a scenario whereby, and I'm, of course we're talking about Europe right now, but the United States is heading there, putting them in a position whereby they have to then fight and deal with things which are extremely problematic to say the least. Yeah. Uh, on so many levels, abortion is a catastrophe. Well, I want to take your challenge. I want to take your challenge. You asked for scripture. Mm -hmm. There are people out there that need to know what the Word says. And we were right in the middle. We were, right, we were reading the Democratic stand. We know where the Democratic Party stands. I think we know where the Republican. We'll read that a little bit in a moment. I just want to read a few scriptures. Is that, that's what you wanted, right? You asked for scriptures. Sure. Deuteronomy 30:19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, <clears throat> blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you 
and, and your, your seed, seed may live. Proverbs 16, 16. Wait a minute. Does that mean unborn? The seed? Can that possibly mean unborn? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding? The Bible talks about abortion. Think of it. <laughs> wow. Imagine that. Oh, I'm telling you. This is Proverbs 6, 16 in the NIV. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to run, rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brethren, hands that shed innocent blood. Which is what abortion does. Yes. Mm -hmm. It kills no about it. It it kills a living human being. No question. Psalm one thirty nine thirteen. You've made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Knit me in together my womb. in my mother's this is what God thinks about it. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Going along with that, Isaiah 44, 2. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who helped you, who will help you. Isaiah 46, 3. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you that remain in the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried you since your birth. Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. Psalm 22, 31. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Psalm 75, 5, 78, 5. He decreed his statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would teach their children. The Republican platform, the Constitution is guaranteed that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property life. deliberately. Life echoes the Declaration of Independence proclamation that all are endowed by their Creator with the inalienable right to life. Accordingly, we assert the sanctity of human life and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. We support a human life amendment to the Constitution and legislation to make clear that the 14th Amendment's protections apply to children before birth. And then it goes on to say, we support the appointment of judges who respect traditional family values and the sanctity of innocent life. Now, you were there when it was being written. You were there when this was being written. And this, this Republican platform says a lot, a right, lot. You've gone through both platforms. You've gone through the Bible verses. It's a no-brainer. Now's decision time. Now's decision time. Yep. People have to say, I reject what God's Word says. I'm going this way, or I'm going to embrace what God's Word says. I'm going, I mean, we don't have to endorse anybody, and we're not going to. That's a simple thing. The Word of God just made it really yeah, clear. I mean, it, it, it endorses itself. It endorses itself. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's what the Declaration of Independence calls a self-evident truth. Yes. I mean, it's, it's oh, like that's good. any dummy. It is a self It's a self-evident truth. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to jump on something you said because you read from the Republican platform, mm -hmm. which quoted from the Declaration. And the Founding Fathers and Declaration said there are three principles. It said there's a creator. And the Creator gives a certain set of rights, and John Adams and others made a really good point that the rights that God gave came before government ever existed. So in other words, they weren't, they weren't given by parchments, or these are rights that came from God. The first government that existed was Genesis 9-6. So the Founding mm -hmm. Fathers mm -hmm. held that inalienable rights came in Genesis 1-8. through 8. And in that span of those eight chapters, there's about two dozen inalienable rights that they said, these came from God, not government, therefore government can't touch these. They've got to leave them alone. You got to, and the third thing Declaration says is those inalienable rights, the primary purpose of government is to protect those rights first. So what you have is the right to life. Sam Adams, the father of the American Revolution, said 
that the right to life is the first of all the inalienable rights, the number one right. Now, it's significant because in their day, they also dealt with abortion. I mean, we, we have abortion going on back in the laws of Moses, where that if you injure an unborn child in the womb, there are penalties for injuring the unborn child under the law that God gave Moses. So God says, hey, you don't injure that child in the womb. So I have books on abortion in America from 1808, 1806 in America. Hmm. The legal codes back in Virginia and the other colonies forbid abortion. And it, I've got, matter of fact, I've got a book right here. Let me just pull it out. This is done by a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a signer of the Constitution. He started the first law school in America. This is the first law book used in American schools. He says, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb, and by the law that life is protected, he says, a part of the common law. So as soon as you knew there was a child in the womb, at that point, law kicks in and says, you've got to protect that child. Now, with technology, we know within eight days. Back then, it took two to three months to know. But whatever mm -hmm. it was that you knew, you kicked it in. So here's the deal. That's the first of the inalienable rights. What I have found from a political standpoint is if you can tell me where any person in Congress, any person in the Senate, any person is on that one right, I will tell you where they are on every other right. You tell me where they are on abortion, I'll tell you where they are on the right of self-defense. Mm -hmm. You tell me where they are on abortion, I'll tell you where they are on the rights of religious conscience. You tell me where they are on abortion, I'll tell you how they voted on the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. You tell me where they are on abortion, I'll tell you how they voted on climate change. You. Because if you get the first one wrong, it's, you come to a fork in the trail. If you get on the wrong road, you're on mm -hmm. the wrong road, and mm -hmm. you're going to be making wrong decisions from thereafter. If you get the life issue wrong, you'll get economic issues. And see, there, there's a division, particularly within the Republican Party, that says, oh, we don't care about social issues like life. We care about economic issues. We've got to get taxes under control and debt under control and spending. I can show you a one-to-one -one correlation that if you're right on the life issue, you're right on the economic issues. Wow. If you're wrong on the life issue, you're wrong on the economic issues. If you get that one wrong, you're on the wrong track and you'll get everything else wrong. That is so important, being right on the life issues. Mm -hmm. We've got so much more for you right after this break. Yes, our president did speak at the, in September at the United Nations. He did say religious fundamentalism needs to go. Yes, the definition of fundamentalism is somebody who actually reads scripture, believes scripture, and desires to live a life according to mm -hmm. scripture. And he wants to do away with it. Uh, Hillary Clinton says she wants to change deep-seated religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. And we're watching, you know, all life matters. And God knows us and knit us together in our mother's womb. It's very important for us, you know, which platform are we going to sign our name to? That's what a vote is. Mm -hmm. Not voting is signing our name to whatever happens, and voting is signing our name. So it's very important to study the platforms that are available on the VF means, and Torch, right? and then uh, go vote. Um, don't sit back. Vote. It t the, the future of this country is, is, is going to be amazing as it is, mm -hmm. but our vote is very, very important. I want to pray with you right now. Father God, we love you. We thank you, Father God, for for just speaking, Lord. We think your confidence can be in you no matter what's happening in the earth. I thank you right now for each and every one that's watching and listening, God, that you're stirring their heart about getting involved as a citizen in the nation, as a Christian citizen in this nation, Father God. We pray a blessing and protection over the homes of our viewers and listeners, Father God. And we pray, Lord, for the courage to vote and vote according to a platform that's in agreement with your word, Father God. Lord, we just ask you, God, that you would end abortion in this land, that you would send revival, that you would send a third great awakening, we pray. In Jesus' name, God bless. And don't forget, you can find out more about us at vfntv.com, including the torch. God bless. Thank you for watching VFN TV. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. Don't forget you can join us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download our app and sign up for our newsletter, The Torch, at vfntv.com.